Welcome. Um, today is day 4,751, and I am absolutely thrilled to welcome Stuart Onan to virtually to Boswell Book Company for our virtual event series. Stuart, welcome. Hey, uh, everybody. Stuart's, of course, the author of more than 20 books, uh, too many to name. Uh, so let me tell you a few of my favorites. Uh, so you know where I'm coming from in this conversation. Um, I love his first book, the historic collection In the Walled City, won the Drew Hines Prize, uh, published by University of Pittsburgh Press, which is near and dear to my heart as a big grad. Um, he's also author of books, The Night Country, Last Night at the Lobster, Emily Alone, City of Secrets, so many more. Um, we're here in Wisconsin. I, I got to mention a prayer for the dying as well, set in Wisconsin. Um, he's edited some, a couple of anthologies, and he's written a book about baseball with Stephen King, um, but then he came to his senses and took off the Red Sox cap, put his Pirates cap back on. Yeah, of course, got his Red Sox t-shirt. Come on. He's still representing, you're up in the East right now, correct? I'm in New England right now, so yeah. You got to represent Absolutely. We're here to talk about his wonderful brand new book, Ocean State. Um, I absolutely love this novel, Stuart. Uh, congrats on it. Thank you. Thank of you. course. Um, yeah, and let's jump into it. So let me ask if you would, just to kind of set us up for anyone who's not familiar with the novel, maybe give us give us the elevator pitch for it and read a page or two. Okay, uh, the pitch would be Teenage Love Triangle in... Rhode, Rhode Island resort town in the off season. Um, so it's, and, and, and for me and for, for my readers, it's a Halloween book. And I think this is my third or fourth Halloween book. I love a Halloween book. Um, so there's, there's a little bit of Stephen King in it. There's a little bit of Ray Bradbury in it. And there's probably a whole lot of Shirley Jackson in it. And I will read just the very beginning, about a minute or so, not too long. Thanks. In the house by the line and twine. When I was in eighth grade, my sister helped kill another girl. She was in love, my mother said, like it was an excuse. She didn't know what she was doing. I had never been in love then, not really, so I didn't know what my mother meant, but I do now. This was in Ashaway, Rhode Island, outside Westerly, down along the shore. That fall, we lived in a house by the river, across the road from the mill where my grandmother had met my grandfather. The line and twine was closed, posted with rusty, no trespassing signs, but just above the dam, someone had snipped a hole in the fence with bolt cutters so you could sneak in the back. We used to roller skate up and down the aisles between the dusty looms, angel weaving, teaching me how to do crossovers and go backwards. She could do spins like an ice skater, her hands making shapes in the air. I wanted to do spins and be graceful like her, but I was chubby and a klutz, and when I stood beside her in church, I was invisible. My mother said I shouldn't worry, that in time I'd find my special talent. I was a late bloomer, she said, as if that was supposed to be comforting. What if I didn't have a special talent, I wanted to ask. What if a hopeless nerd was all I'd ever be? Thank you for that. What a great introduction that is. Um... To both of the characters, I think, or two of the characters, I should say. There's a lot of great characters in this book. Um, I always like to know, I, I, I want to talk about a lot of those characters, but I always like to know, and one of the first things I always ask an author, and I think this far into your career, this many wonderful books under your belt, you've got to have a decent idea by now when you've got an idea that's going to work as a book. You know, when you're like, yeah, this one could be a book. Um, this one's got legs. And so I, I'm curious, you know, what, what was the what was the spark? What was the moment for Ocean State when you knew, like, here's yeah, this idea is this is a novel. Um, well, it, it's based on an actual murder in a, a Connecticut town. It's, it's a town called New Milford, which is a river town. It's on the Housatonic, um, and it was the murder of a young girl, 13 year old girl named Marianne Measles. Um, and Marianne had just moved to the town. She came from a broken family, didn't have very much money. And she decided the way to get in with this clique that she wanted to join was to sleep with the boys in the clique. And the girlfriends of the boys did not like this. And they convinced the boys to kill her, basically. Um, and so there were eight uh, young people involved in the murder. And um, it, was, it was horrible, terrible, awful details 
But the combination of that murder of a 13 year old girl in a small river town, um, I knew that was a pretty big story. Um, I wasn't sure how to get it into a book, but it felt like something that could be a book, all the people involved. Um, and it took me, I think it happened in 1997. So it took me 23 years uh, to really find a way into it. Um, at first I thought it was gonna be about Marianne and her mother um, and her sister. And cause I kept trying, who's my point of view character? Where am I narrating this from? You know, whose point of view and when? Um, and it took me until three years ago to decide that it was a sister, but not the sister of the victim, but the sister of one of the killers. And once I realized that that was gonna be the main relationship between those two sisters, I started to think really hard about what it means to be a younger sister and to have an older sister who is this role model, who is kind of the golden girl. Um, and, and what happens when that, that role model does something so horrible. Uh, and I, I kind of fell into thinking about Shirley Jackson's We Have Always Lived in the Castle, which has that basic structure. Mary Cat, the younger sister, narrates it. Um, and she's kind of squirrely and odd. Um, and the older sister is this role model, although she is suspected of having poisoned other members of the family. And, and the whole small town knows it. So small New England town, sisters that do this terrible thing, they're kind of outcast. And I thought oh, I can use that framework in a way. And I just had to come up with who that younger sister was. And, and in writing that voice, that Marie voice in the very beginning, I kind of came to it, I think, and, and found my, my way into her and discovered who she was. Um, but for a long time, the first line of the book wasn't um, when I was in eighth grade, my sister helped kill another girl. It was that summer we lived in a house by the river. Because I just thought of the two of them and that family within that house being besieged on the outside by this town that hates them. Um, so again, the two of them against the whole world. And, and that dynamic, you know, starts to play out, I think, even in the first five or six pages, because it's the two of them against the mother. Yeah, I think it's fascinating how you frame, you know, we're listening to Marie immediately, and she's both looking back on her life, but then she's also comparing herself so much to her sister. Um, I was thinking about that too. I think it's really fascinating how you tell that story, that those sister stories and that, um, that back and forth comparison, because you spend a lot of time in the book thinking about a horrible thing that happens, but then where does it leave these people and who gets to leave and who gets to move on from it and who is scarred from it? And I think you come up with some interesting answers to that in the book. Well, and that, that seems to me just sort of the outside of the container. The organization to mm -hmm. me seems to be, what does it feel like to be in love? Um, and, and Marie, I mean, second line, she's like, I, I didn't know what it meant to be in love, but I do now. Yeah. Um, and, and the angel goes through that. Uh, Birdie certainly goes through that. Carol, the mother, kind of goes through that. And what, what does love make us do? What is love? Um, it, it, it exalts us. It, it it's miserable, it, it's fantastic. Um, and I, I kept thinking of Chekhov and Chekhov says, you know, there's only one story and that story is love. Um, and so I thought a lot about uh, the lady with the dog, um, that classic old timey story, you know, that, that, that ends with, and they knew this was just the beginning. And I was like, I wanna go, I wanna go beyond that and really, right. you know, get, in the, get into the consequences of it. There's this, this first line of a story that I always attribute to Joyce Carol Oates. And it's, I was in love with two men, so one of them had to die. I've looked for this story, I don't think it exists. I think I made it up and just attributed it to Joyce because no one's gonna, right. no one's gonna bother, no one's gonna yeah. run it down. No one's gonna sounds read right it. Too. Yeah, story. it sounds right for her. Yeah, yeah. but it's that, that almost a Gothic kind of formula um, mm -hmm. and, and a simple one too. I mean, the, the love triangle that goes back. Um, as it will. So. I do. I do. Um, yeah, speaking of going bad, let's talk about Angel Thumb. Um, because I think <laughs> you do a lot of interesting things with her. First of all, uh, before I, I'm really curious. So obviously Angel's named after Angel Olsen. The book is no. dedicated. No? No. no. Okay. No, okay. That, that, that's just a weird coincidence. 
Okay. And that's an odd coincidence. I'd already started the book and got it going. Mm -hmm. And Angel was my, my main character. And I just fell into the music of Angel Olsen as kind of the, the mood of the book mm -hmm. and the background, the soundtrack okay. of the book. Um, okay. Yeah. I was curious. No, it, it, it just happened that way. And, and it was too late to change it. Right. Now, once, once you get that character's name correct, you mm -hmm. can't just rip it out of them because it's part of them. And I was like, ah, oh, shit. I, I wasn't crazy about that echo, but there it was. Interesting. Um, but Angel oh, Olsen. I was curious because, yeah, Angel Olsen, I mean, the, the two epigraphs of the book are pulled from Angel Olsen's songs. I mean, for anyone who doesn't know Angel Olsen, great songwriter, um, singer songwriter. She's also kind of seems to be the indie rocker's go to duet partner for the last 10 years. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. but yeah, talk about the mood of the songs then and, and how that kind of, yeah, what did that? Well, I mean, she, book, she, she writes so well about um, romantic love gone wrong um, and, and, the, and the dangers of romantic love and the, the miseries and, and ecstasies of romantic love. And I thought it was it's kind of perfect for, you know, what I'm writing about, which is these, these two young women and, you know, Marie, the younger sister, who is kind of on that cusp of, girlhood and young womanhood she's 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 trying to stay a child in a way mm -hmm. um and and then she has this cautionary tale of her sister who has become this young woman and and love has made her do this she thinks awful thing um i, I think angel olsen writes really really well about that um and so she became kind of the muse for the book and i was listening to her music throughout the writing of it um and to this to the extent that there i think there are 53 of her songs that she's sung sort of woven throughout the books and, and some of her lyrics, little little Easter eggs, little things that her fans would know. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, this weird little homage to her um, as well on the side. Well, well, the rest of the book just keeps rolling as it, as it does. Um, mm -hmm. you know, but really once, once I got Angel, the character going, um, she doesn't have a lot. Um, and she knows this. She understands that she doesn't have a lot. She doesn't have a father in her life. Um, her mother doesn't particularly appreciate her very much. She knows that they don't have the means for her to leave the small town where they live in this crappy little rental house on this crappy road next to an abandoned mill. Um, but she does have the boyfriend. Um, she is good looking. She is athletic. She is relatively popular before all this happens. Um, and then she becomes completely an outcast that no one will, you know, she's untouchable in a way. Um, and so for her, it becomes just the two of them, herself and Miles, the boyfriend against the world and becomes somewhat desperate. And she falls into this almost romantic trap uh, where she sees her life as romantic, even though she knows that it isn't. Um, and she's, you know, from, the, from early on in the book, when, when Miles cheats on her, she understands that, that Birdie, her rival has taken the only thing that she actually has. Um, that, that makes her worth something. And that idea of your, yourself being worthless because you've lost this romantic love is something I think that Angel Olsen writes about really, really well uh, mm -hmm. in the songs. Um, and it's a desperate feeling. And I, I think Angel throughout the book feels, from the moment that she finds out that Miles is not hers anymore and she has to fight to get him back, she feels very desperate. Um, and she she latches on to the, the, the few powers that she has to get him back and make him do her bidding. Um, so it becomes, it becomes about possession at that point. Um, and when love is about possession, that's really, really dangerous. Um, and there, there's only a few ways that can go. <laughs> and, yeah. and, it, and, it goes, and it goes really, really badly. But Angel is fighting for basically her sense of who she is and herself. Um, and, and it's all she can do. And that's an interesting dichotomy, I think, in Angel. Um... That too, she's so love struck and so overpowered by this and so overpowered by that yearning, that wanting for, you know, the love of Miles, but also the love of what it makes her, the love of who she's she's decided it makes her be, exactly as you're saying. Um, and you spend, I, I mean, the story is told in reflection from Marie's point of view, but we spend a lot of time very close to Angel um, throughout the book. And so I'm curious what it was like writing Angel because you walk this really interesting line, I think, of a lot of what you were describing, but at the same time, there's some very cold and calculating things that lead up to her orchestrating a murder. 
Um, and I mean, we're not giving anything away to say there's a murder in this book, right? Um, yeah, there you, is. You, you did tip your hand on that one. Um, it was a, a bold move to do so, I think. Um, and I think it works. I, I think it's great because then it draws us into focusing on exactly what I'm talking about. But what was that like? What were you, what kind of headspace were you in? What were you drawing on to think about Angel in these two ways, you know, this, this, you know, teenager who's in love and so is out of her mind, but also kind of calculating murder orchestrator. Well, I think, I think that goes back to the source material. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how these eight people decided that this was the thing to do, uh, to, eliminate, to eliminate this person from the world because they were inconvenient to them or because they trespassed somehow on what they felt was their territory. Um, it seems very human to do, but it also seems very inhuman or inhumane. And so to try to get myself into that space and say, you know, who would do this and why? And, and that question of why is, I think, way more interesting than the idea of the old who done it, right. you know, um, the, the why. And, that, and then, then how and how do you live with the consequences of that? Um, because there, there has to be some regret to it, I think, because it seems a very short sighted thing to do. Um, it, it's of the moment. And I think that's true when we're talking about romantic love. Everything is in that very moment now and in a very charged emotional moment, um, which if you look back on it from four or five years down the road, you're like, what was I thinking? Oh, I, was, I was crazy. I must have been in love or something. Uh, but in this case, it's something that you, it's it should, can't be it can't be taken back. It's it's irretrievable. And, and in some ways, she's irredeemable and understands that she's irredeemable and and the question of why she does it and she looks at it hard after it happens and thinks you know i only did this because i was going to lose miles i was going to lose him anyway yeah i was going to lose him anyway in seven months so was it out of despair was it out of need and and i think when i when i get down to it with with these characters it's that question of our our, our, our need for love our, our desperate need to be loved and, and to be seen as worthy of love. Um, there, there's that, that line from John Gardner in The Art of Fiction that, that readers will follow a character anywhere if they're worthy of and capable of love. Mm. And the question to me for this book, which was The Edge, was how does Angel fit into that there? You know, is she worthy of our love after what she's done? It's hard to say. And Marie has to make that call, right? Um, yeah. Then is she capable of love? I think she she ends up having to ask herself those questions after the terrible things have happened. But that's where I think I get to go a little further than the usual who done it because the consequences are real life consequences, which is what I'm always interested in, rather mm -hmm. than you know the slickness of crime fiction or detective fiction or the cozy or something like that. You know, this I'm treating it as a real and serious thing that happens to real people and what is the actual outcome of all this and how do people carry this forward in their lives um, and of course Marie is the one who has to end up carrying the story forward in her life um, the other people in her family also have to, to go on they can't simply quit I mean that doesn't suddenly go oh the end um, you know it's it's life life continues on um, so, I, so I wanted that in there as well besides sort of the, the slick hook at the beginning and the sort of the, the promise of, oh, we're gonna see a murder. Um, I wanted to get, I wanted, I guess I'm, I'm using that, I guess, as bait to get the reader in to actually do something different. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But I think, I, but I, but I think I've done that before, so. <laughs> Maybe. Um, yeah, speaking of her gonna lose him, I think there's, there's an acknowledgement early in the book too that she's even says, I'm probably gonna lose her him, you know, to some rich girl in college even yeah. before a lot of this stuff gets rolling. So that's, yeah, she, she's thinking about that and the way you have her thinking about this um, as a means to build desperation, to build everything is pretty powerful. Well, well, well for her, it, it's that lack of means, right? What, what, other choices, what other choice does she have? William Maxwell says, and I think it's in um, So Long See Tomorrow, uh, a similar book, um, the reason life is so strange is that people have so little choice. And I don't, I don't think that, that Angel sees that she has any choice whatsoever. And so she's trying to hold on to, to what little that she has. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, um, I think that 
I swear I didn't send him these questions beforehand, but that rolls really nicely into something else I want to talk about, which is um, I think in this book and like a lot of your work, and it's part of what I love about your work, um, so much of that is based on the idea of class and choice, um, the particularly how being working class shapes people's lives. And in your books, your, particularly in this one, you know, your characters aren't going around like Bertie's not going around say, saying, I work at CVS because I'm low class and that's lousy, right? Um, that's not happening. But, but still, there's this deep understanding that every decision from what house this family can live in um, to even who their mother dates, her expectations uh, for her life, their expectations for their own lives, um, like this kid I know can do this, Miles can go do this, but I have to do this, I can only do this. It's so, so predicated on class. Um, and how were you focused on that? How are you thinking about that when you're working on this book? Well, again, source material. Um, Marianne Measles came from a family of, of very little means, uh, kind mm -hmm. of um, uprooted in a way, uh, displaced. Um, and, I, and I started thinking about, you know, that, that lack of roots and that lack of continuity, the lack of someone who's there all the time, um, the, the missing father. I think Bertie also has a missing father. He's died as well, even though the mother is, the mother is much more stable in that case. But um, yeah, and also, I mean, I'm, I'm always thinking about that in terms of this, this place along the Rhode Island shore and also in Connecticut. I mean, Connecticut is, I think, the, has the um, highest per capita income in the US, you know, mm -hmm. and yet there are parts of Connecticut like uh, Willimantic that for years were known as heroin town. Um, so the, the disparity between the haves and have nots is very, very large there and very obvious there. And so when you, when you bring that to the setting of the rundown mill town that's next to a beach, um, the disparity is very, very great. So I knew that, that I was gonna be working with that because I knew it was also gonna be a portrait of the place um, and, and the people that the, the cast was gonna be a reflection of the place. Um, that's why we have Miles, his family has all kinds of money and they have a multi-million dollar house directly on the beach um, that he then takes these girls to. And these girls are from you know average working class families and they're very impressed by it. They're like, oh my gosh, look at this great view. So he's using that, that, that money and that class. And, and in terms of Miles, I always think of ease. There's an ease of life for Miles, right? Mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's good looking, he's got money, he's got this car, the family has the house, he's going off to college. You know, for him, high school is just kind of a playground. He'll accept this, this love and adoration from these two girls, but it doesn't really mean all that much to him because he's gone, he's out of town. Um, so he's kind of this, this weird, empty playboy figure in a way. Um, not better or worse than the average teenage boy. Um, but in this situation, you can see that he is, as Fitzgerald would say, a careless person. Um, he, he really has no cares in the world. Everything works out for him. So the fact that, that Angel can actually manipulate him to do what she wishes, which we find out later, of course, not, not to give everything away, um, yeah. is, is kind of amazing in a way. She's okay. using power that she has there, mm -hmm. uh, whereas, whereas Bertie seems a little bit more powerless. But that, but also that question of, of, you know, work and ease and comfort, and that comes directly from growing up in Pittsburgh um, and, and thinking about who's working, who's working where, are they making good money? Um, and, and that worry of, of falling out of the middle class um, and, and, and not being able to pay the bills and having to move um, and you know, having to uproot and find something else. Um, and I think that's, that's ruled Carol, the mother, um, for most of her uh, single life. Um, and then it comes out, of course, working in the assisted living uh, facility where she works and that she's taking care of people that have all the money in the world so they can go to this assisted living shelter. So to be taking care of someone who has to live in this crappy little rental place. Yeah. Right, right. Um, Just to yeah, no, I mean, speaking of class signifiers, I, I was gonna ask too. Um, I think one great one that you draw attention to in the book, and actually um, someone pointed this out to me, who else, uh, uh, someone else who read the book pointed this out um, to me, that you draw attention to their cars quite often. Um, and when I thought back on it, I was like, bingo. Uh, but you nailed it. it <laughs> the book set 2009, um, and I was, I was like, you, you absolutely know working class Hector's got the charger, whereas rich boy Miles has the, the new Eclipse. Um, 
and that was so it's I don't know spot on for that um what? but yeah I mean uh, why the cars I, I there, there's also this great scene where the boys cars are parked facing each other um I don't know were you were you thinking about that or was that just fun to play with um that's just it's kind of just natural I guess I'm a car person um, um and you know having grown up in the, in the 60s and 70s and all that sort of great Detroit rolling metal. Um, no, it just seemed it seemed fitting that Hector would have something like the Charger, and it seemed fitting for Miles, you know, to have the Eclipse there. Just, just, I don't know. It seemed to fit their personalities, um, mm -hmm. just metaphorically. And that that scene, of course, you're talking about after the party when when Bertie thinks that, you know, Miles has totally forgotten her, and Miles isn't thinking about her at all, and they go out to to go to the car to Hector's car, and she finds Miles's car parked facing it directly head to head as if challenging him for birdie there um yeah and everything is and, and when you're in love everything is a message everything is a sign you know you're looking for something you know anything a text message you know a word um you know anything that you share your song you know the places that you go everything is super super charged mm -hmm. and that was really fun to work with with birdie and angel and you know even even carol and and Marie to a little lesser extent, um, but and that that kind of you know mad romantic you know passion um, the characters just just magnetized everything just kind of sticks and everything they see you know is telling them something so it's it's great characters to work with yeah absolutely I love the um, the obsessions over the one word texts or how long it takes to text throughout the book that was captured really well you know. Um, or uh, yeah, they're, they're both obsessing over Miles and Schur and uh, you know, the Schur text that means the world. I thought, yeah, really well captured. And, and I also wanted to use social media as is that almost mm -hmm. that the third level of the fishbowl that those, those two young women are in, they're in the small town where everybody knows everyone else's business. You know, then they're in high school, you know, and then their pictures are you're actually up on Facebook, you know, and, and you know, the, the, the betrayal, the, um, the jealousy, it's all there for everybody to see and everybody to then comment on and chime in on. So mm -hmm. once that happens, both of them are kind of, um, they're kind of on the run after that. They're, they, they feel like they're being pursued by the entire town, not just one another. Right. It heightens the sense of storytelling too, because they're so, you know, now, now even they know everything's on the record, right? And, <laughs> and, the, and there's, also, there's also no escape. Yeah, there's also no. It's it's not like one of them is suddenly going to take off and leave town. It's gonna it's right. you know it's gonna happen, which again is that promise of the first line, you know that's that narrative promise that yes this is going to happen and you're going to understand it, right? Eventually, and uh, yeah, and perhaps there'll be more to it too. Yeah, um, we we've nibbled around Ashaway a lot. Ashaway, Rhode Island. It's a real place, eight miles off the ocean. Um, and I think interestingly, speaking of Connecticut, it's right on the Connecticut border too. Um, and it's working class town, factory town. Um, and as we were saying before, I was um, oh before this, I was actually on Google Maps perusing around Ashaway, um, looking at the line and twine where they, they live near the, the line and twine, which makes uh, racket strings in real life. You can, you can get your tennis racket strung with line and twine strings. Um, and I thought it was very interesting. And it's, it's similar to places all over the United States. I mean, uh, a few miles in from the coast, um, you have the coastal waterfronts. And you were talking a bit about this, but then these, the working class places where everyone who essentially is the service class to those coastal folks are actually living and playing out their lives. Um, so especially you, I know you spent a lot of time and spent some years in the Northeast, but you're a pit guy now. So what, what took you back there? I mean, the setting of the real events, I presume, had quite a bit to do with that. But what, what took you back and why Ashaway? Uh, COVID. COVID actually took me back uh, because I, I began this book, I think it was the last week of March 2020, um, which is the beginning of, you know, what we call lockdown, which just means you didn't leave the house a whole lot. Um, so I couldn't go out and do location scouting for the Connecticut River Valley. Uh, I was going to move it from New Milford and the Housatonic River over to Essex or Haddam, Connecticut, um, with the Connecticut River, which is a little bit bigger and was, I guess, the, um, the, the, the model for Twain and the Mississippi when, when 
Twain was there in Hartford. Um, I wanted to move it there and, and write about a small New England river town, um, which would probably end up being a little bit of a mill town, but also on the Connecticut River with the deep harbors, it would also be a whaling town from the past. So it was going to be a hearkening back to the New England of the 19th century. Um, but because I couldn't go and actually do my location scouting, you know, run around, and drive around and take pictures and go to the Chamber of Commerce and talk with people and, and learn the history of it. I decided I'd set it somewhere that I already know. Uh, so I said in Ashaway, which was the hometown of my mother-in-law. Oh. Um, and her parents, in fact, lived directly across the street from the line and twine. They met there, they married, they lived next door to it and they worked there their entire lives. Um, so I already knew that area and the feel of that area. And I knew because I was, besides the, the source material, but also that Shirley Jackson weirdness that I wanted to get in and that spookiness, uh, which also meant that I was gonna move it from the summer. I began writing the book and it was set in the summer. And I was like, I didn't like that. I'm gonna move it over to Halloween because I love Halloween. I feel at home at Halloween. So while I was going out on the limb writing all female point of view characters, I still was able to hold on to stuff that I knew really, really well, which was the setting and the time of year there. Um, so I had that mood and I had that tone so I could concentrate a little bit more on getting the voices right. Um, and, then, and then getting the action right and, and the sequence right there. Um, so, so that's that's why Ashaway. And you know, once you once you start digging into Ashaway, it's it's very rich. It's very it's very all this great material comes out of it. And just starting to work with the the decrepit mill, the mill that's been sitting there, you know, unused for you know 30, 40 years. Um, that's great stuff. I mean, I love that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, it absolutely sets the pole. Um, speaking of Halloween, you mentioned Halloween before, and um, this is a total aside, but someone in the comments earlier said, name, will you name all of your Halloween books? What are, so, and, and then to everyone listening, if you want, um, we'll get to questions and comments uh, soon, but if you've got questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or whatever. But yeah, what are the other, I know The Night Country. The Night Country is the obvious Halloween book. Um, uh, the Names of the Dead. Uh, my second novel, it's a Vietnam novel, but the Ithaca sections are actually set during Halloween. Um, uh, Snow Angels as well. Um, there, there's there's the, that, I think it's Devil's Night that I'm talking about in Snow Angels because it's set in Pennsylvania, where one of the persons says, let's go out and break shit. <laughs> it's like, okay. Perfect. Um, yeah. Um, Perfect. I think there's another one in there as well. Um, I know there's a section, a Halloween section in Henry himself there as well yeah uh, and those are the ones that, that's come to mind right now but yeah definitely night night country snow angels ocean states names of the dead that's a fair amount of them. yeah that's i mean that's plenty of halloween and now and now ocean state too yeah um yeah you said you were location scout that's interesting to me um now i'm just curious do you do that for a lot of your books or a lot of location scouting a lot of actual travel research or have you done that? When I, when I can, you know, mm -hmm. when, when, I, when I can do that, I'll, I'd like to, you know, you have this, this mood in your head that you get from memory, but there's also, you can add things in when you're there live and say, oh, I really should throw that in. Oh, that would be great. You know, like, so, I mean, when you drive around a place or walk through a place and you're wearing the mask of your characters, things will jump out at you that wouldn't jump out at, you know, me, myself. Um, so if I'm going somewhere and I'm thinking, oh, I'm Arthur going back to Butler, or if I'm Marie going back to Ashaway, they're going to see that that world in a very different way. Um, so sometimes you can find things that, you know, actually make sense. Um, I'll go and I'll take a lot of notes, a ton of notes, a lot of pictures, a lot of video, and I probably use five percent of it. Um, but yeah. but even I mean any any uh, that I that I do use is kind of gold because it's a discovery, and that's. To me, that's what the book is about, is, is discovering all this stuff, you know, so that the book as a whole is rich and eventful and all fits together. Um, I, think, I, think, I think that's the key to it. I mean, if I know too much about a book going into it, I'll get bored. Um, so it's, it's that discovery within the character, within the voice, you know, day by day going through the draft work um, that, that, makes it, that makes it worthwhile, I think, it makes it fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I've got a couple more questions for you here and then we'll jump to some uh, questions. But I, I um, 
Oh gosh, I missed a couple of my character questions. Let's go back. Why not? We're here. I have you here. You're stuck. So um, I, I I love Carol, their mother. I think um, you know she's she's trying to live her life on her own too, and she's got these kids, and she's trying to do right by them. But also that means different things. I think that means because of her situation. Um, so Carol's, you know as we've suggested, pretty hand to mouth. Um, but at the same time, she's trying to find a little bit of love on her own. And I really like how you juxtaposed her very adult, um, in a lot of ways compromised, in a lot of ways compromising kind of search for some sort of love and companionship against the girls, the younger girls. Um, what's different for her in that? And what's, what's maybe still the same for her? Well, I mean, it's different in that she's, not quite middle-aged, but certainly adult in, in her, her low 40s. And she doesn't quite know what she wants and what she's going to be able to get. You know, what, what does she need to settle for Russ or does she want to be with Wes, even though Wes is dangerous and kind of a mess and doesn't have any money whatsoever? Um, she knows she's over Frank. So it's interesting in that even though she's the adult, she doesn't know what she wants. Whereas the two, the two teenage young women, they know exactly what they want. The problem is they want the same thing and they can't have it. Um, so I, I liked that, that it's not quite as romantic. It's not quite as free, I guess, um, in, in, in Carol's world. Um, everything has a consequence. Everything has a price. Everything, as you say, is a compromise. Um, and, and so she misses that, that, that wildness of her younger life, but she knows it's time to put that away but she can't quite break that. So she ends up sleeping with these two men at the same time, um, which in the eyes of her daughters, her prudish daughters think it's a terrible thing, an awful thing. And she becomes an, an off to them in their eyes, a bad role model. Um, and, and, and loses certainly the respect of Marie, um, who not knowing what love is, judges her without, no, without knowing anything. There, which, which is which I think is terribly sad, but it's also what children do um, sometimes. Um, and, and so all of her shortcomings um, seem, seem to bite her in the ass um, and, and have for some time. And, and she's not very happy about that, but she knows she has to go forward. She knows what is right is to somehow try to protect Angel, even though she basically understands that Angel is guilty and has done terrible things but she is still her daughter. Um, so her, her adult perspective is so, so different, um, certainly from Marie's, uh, but definitely from Angel's and Birdie's. She's gone beyond all that stuff and would look back on it and say that's, that's ridiculous, silly stuff and dumb, it's dumb. Um, and yet she herself is caught in that, you know, what am I hoping for? And there's that, that, that scene after they go to the casino her and Russ, and they go to Russ's apartment there, and they look out at the stars and the whole, you know, the whole universe. And she, she doesn't know what to even hope for. She doesn't even know what to wish for, uh, which is a terrible, terrible thing. Where the younger women, know their their wishes are so precise, you know, and, and so inflamed and so impassioned. Um, what is it like to be in love? Um, it may be that, that it may be that Carol doesn't know anymore. I have written here the question, I think we've mostly answered it, but it's, I think you just hit the nail on the head to me, at least for why this is Marie's story to tell, because that's such a central question for Marie going in and perhaps that she keeps carrying. What, what does it mean to be in love? Um, and yeah, Marie's she, perspective. So, sorry, go she, ahead. She, she doesn't understand that and she doesn't understand what's happened. You know, she, she, Looking back 10, 12, 14 years later, she still doesn't understand why did this happen precisely the way that it happened. Um, and so like, like many a first person retrospective narrator, she narrates it and she gives it to the reader and says, I don't know what to make of this, do you? Uh, because she feels helpless in front of the events um, and her feelings for certainly her mother and her sister. Um, she doesn't even know quite what to think about Birdie or Birdie's mother. Yeah. But she is the one who's trying to put it all together and make sense of it because she did play her own part in it. Um, but she was just too young to understand. Yeah, well, she's one of two. And this was this 
yeah, she's one of two people trying to put it because you're trying to put it all together and make sense of all these people too. Um, and I'm, I'm really curious. Um, I kept asking myself, like as a writer, just as a person, um, you know, these, everyone transgresses in this book. Uh, some people pay some prices, some people, you know, lose, one person loses their life. Um, but everyone's transgressing in some way in this book. And as, as I keep writing it, reading it, and again, perhaps it's that Marie perspective, um, but I'm just really curious, you as the writer, did, did you come to a place where you're forgiving them, accepting them? Oh, I, I hope I'm accepting them from the very beginning. Um, that that I think I think all four of them are, are worthy and capable of love. I think I think that's why I, I kind of chose them. Um, yeah, I, I, I probably feel more for them. I, I would hope than almost any reader ever could, um, having spent so much time with them. Um, and I mean, I mean, I, I've had all those thoughts and all those daydreams that that are that go around every word that's in the book. I mean, so for every like sentence in the book, there's like 20 or 30 other ones that I've at least thought. Um, and yeah, and just, just keeping them in mind and, and, and that question of what do they want? What do they desire and why? Um, they desire things that we all want. They all want to be loved. They all want to be accepted. Uh, it's it's the, the Morrissey line, right? I am human and I need to be loved um, just like everybody else does. It doesn't happen. For everybody and and that's very very hard or what happens when the person that's supposed to love you the most in the world uh rejects you or throws you away what do you do then it's a very common thing that we have to deal with um it's very hard um so so angel i i can forgive her and understand her because you know the one person that she thought she could rely on that she's given everything to um basically just throws her affections away um for 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 really nothing for for sport in a way, um, and, and Bertie has put her whole heart into Miles and Miles equivocates and flip flops and you know, makes these promises and doesn't fulfill them like so many people do. Um, so yeah, I, I, I feel for all of them, I think. Um, but maybe especially mostly Marie because she seems to be you know, just from her age and, and from her, you know, just the way she is um, the most innocent there. And still, I think still retains some of her innocence because she's, She's covered up so much. She's held herself so close, um, maybe because of what's happened. But maybe not just this season, but even what's happened before this with the parents there. Um, it was her and uh, Angel against the world, and now Angel's gone. And, and what does she do? So this gets me to the my central question about all of your writing, and it's present in this book, um, and I, we've already gotten one person who's asked a, a similar question um, in, in the chat here, and uh, it's particularly about the, the women characters in your book, but I think all of the characters in all of your books, I, I'm consistently stunned, just blown away, um, by how close you're able to get to characters, um, and it's not just it's not just the good trick of a telling detail here or there. Um, it's every time I read a Stuart O'Nan book, I feel like Stuart O'Nan is telling me about people that he lived an entire life with them. He knows their whole life. Um, and so how do you get this close to your characters? I, I, I guess I, what I'm asking, what is the magic? What is the secret? Uh, um, how does I, it happen? I, I mean, why do we read fiction? You know, we, we read fiction because we want to feel what it's like to be this other person. Um, we always have this question, what does it feel like to be you? Um, it's a natural curiosity that we have that in real life really can't be fulfilled. It can't be slaked in a way, but it can be quenched in fiction. Um, and that's why I love to read fiction. I've always loved to read fiction. What does it feel like to be this person undergoing this thing that I may never go through? Who, what is it like to be this person who otherwise I would never probably meet in my life, this person that comes from a different continent, this person that speaks a different language, this person who is a different everything for me. That, that seems to me the most interesting thing. I think John Edgar Wideman said that uh, a book is a gift, right? Uh, I don't say that you have to read this, you know, you choose to read this and to enter this other world about, of your own volition, and make that leap into the other and find out about 
their joy and their suffering and 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 you know and find out in, in doing so everything about yourself as well um you may see yourself in other people um the other the other classic quote is flaubert right madame bovary say moi i mean uh fitzgerald said that to understand a character or to write a character all he needed was an emotion that he could understand and feel himself and i think that's true and so i'll start with the emotional basis of a character and say, you know, can I feel what Marie feels? Have I felt what Marie has felt? Um, and, and the answer for that is yes. I mean, Flannery O'Connor says that, you know, by the, by the age of six, you know, everyone has learned all, all enough emotions to write fiction, to write a whole novel's worth. Um, because and there's, there's acceptance, there's fear, there's, you know, there's joy, there's love, there's terror, there's, you know, everything. So my, my, Favorite books are ones that I am very close to those characters. So if I'm reading, say, To the Lighthouse and how close, um, you know, we can get to, you know, Mrs. Ramsey or, or to, um, oh, God, what's her name? The, the painter. I've forgotten her name now. Um, crap. Um, to, to want, to want and not to have is that, that, that great line from there. It's so, so good. Um, just getting close, getting close to, you know, Stefan Dedalus and Leopold Bloom and, you know, you know Shithead or Fuckhead and Dennis Johnson's Jesus Son. I mean, you're, 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 you're right there with them going through some very, very big, big things. Um, I, I, I tend to go on the more bland or, or boring side, um, like Emily alone or Henry, but, but spending time with the characters. That's what I like to do as a reader. Um, I like those quiet moments. With a character. I mean, I warn other writers not to write the one person scene, but you know, I, I, I kept being drawn back to these very, very moments of stillness in the books that I liked a lot. Um, and and I, I think that's why we come to fiction. I think so. I mean, a lot of other people would say, no, I don't want that. I want to escape from life and I want to do the cozy mystery or I want to do the gone girl thing or I want to do this thing where things don't have any consequences and, and it's fun. Um, and that's great. I mean, that's the, but that's not really what I want to do. Uh, the question is, what do you think is important enough to put in front of the reader, uh, to show the reader? What do you want to show the reader about the world that they're not getting from everything else, from the Marvel universe, you know, from Breaking Bad, from, from all these other things that are done so well, but aren't doing what you think is important? Um, so that's why I write a book like Last Night of the Lobster. You know, and my agent will say, well, who cares? And I was like, Ugh, uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. well, it's, it's, it, what can I? It's, it's, a, it's a strange because when I, when I began writing, I wanted to put more storyline and more plot and more exciting things into American fiction because I felt it was just too flat and too slice of life and too dull. And I, I went from there to, to I want to say around 2003, and my mantra was dare to be boring um, because because it had just gotten too tarted up with stuff, just too, too, too much. Um, and then I just started stopped thinking that way and just said, we'll go project by project. I'm not here to prove anything. You know, just get close to the characters, get some mood and direction and you'll find something. Well, I all of the books you reference, I would certainly hesitate to call boring. Um, I mean, Last Night at the Lobster is one of my go to gifts for someone who hasn't read it for, what, for everything and yeah um yeah I, I only got a few minutes I don't want to get I, I want to get to a few of these questions I see rolling in but um to bring it back to this book uh Ocean State I, I'm curious uh the nickname Ocean State's the nickname for Rhode Island of course um, I also found out when you Google Ocean State, uh, one of the first things that comes up very appropriately for the book is the Ocean State job lot uh, chain of <laughs> uh, discount retail uh, castaway stores. Um, how'd you land on the title? What's it mean to you? I, I kind of had that from the beginning. When, once, I, once I moved it over to Rhode Island, I just started thinking of it as a kind of an overt metaphor for what it, what it feels like to be in love, right? Um, the ocean can be, you know, calm, it can be wild, it, you know, it, it's, you know, it, it's over two thirds of the world. So it, it's a great motive force. Um, and I guess I had a little bit of the, the, the Velvet Underground song Ocean in my mind, a little bit sort of droney stuff. Um, yeah, it just, it just felt right for the, the setting. 
the ocean state. Plus, I mean, think of all the free advertising I'm getting from those license plates. Man, everyone's just driving around advertising my book here. It's great, you know, all day long. Well, you know, you know the nickname of the job lot. No. Uh, slob lot. It's a uh, ocean state slob lot. Yeah. Yeah. You go in there, it's always dirty, it's always shitty. Everything's cheap and made from China. It's you know, it's oh awful. But yeah. I, but I was thinking way. about going. I was thinking about going tomorrow, so we'll see. Yeah, that sounds appropriate. You gotta stop then. Um, let me grab to a few of these questions here from folks. Um, uh, bu, bu, bu. Here's I'm just gonna go with what worked for the conversation. Todd asks because uh, we were talking about craft a little bit. Um, what's something craft sentence level editing you used to think was super important, but have since decided is not, or is perhaps at the very least overrated? Well, just thinking about sentences. Um, the, the the unit of of drama is not the sentence; it's the scene. Uh, it's always going to be the scene. Um, so I, I try to move away from making that that line so perfect and beautiful and chiming and everything. I think more about what's what's the size of the scene. Does the scene need to be big? Does the scene need to be small? Would, conventionally, would the scene be big, or can I change that and, and like surprise the reader and do something big in a very small scene the way that Fitzgerald does? Um, so yeah, to, to try to stop thinking about it, it's hard for me because I, I I learned to write sentence to sentence by ear and to see that as the ultimate literary value. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think, and this is probably true of the last 20 or 30 years of American writing, the surface of it is too tooled and too beautiful. Um, and actually the dream, the, the dramatic dream that comes up from the sentences isn't as strong as it needs to be, isn't as strong mm -hmm. or complex. So the sentence is just, it's, it's a medium um, and, and that's it. Um, so I, I wish I'd, I wish I could pay less attention to it, um, which is why I think sometimes uh, reading literature in translation and then sometimes really blocky or crappy translations is, is a really way, the way to, to go and to learn about, about drama and what's really important in writing. I mean, I know reading those, those Chekhov, Constance Garnet translations, which are just, they're like made out of wood blocks. Uh, and yet, and yet, uh, the wisdom of Chekhov comes through, the characters and their plight comes through, the scenes come off beautifully. And I think of uh, Ha Jin's first collection, Under the Red Flag, beautiful collection. He was learning English then as a second or third language and decided he was going to write it in English. So the line writing is super crunchy, but the stories are, are so gorgeous and so beautiful. So, mm -hmm. so try to forget as much as you can about the sentence and think more about the scene. Yeah, um, I'm going to combine a couple questions because um, Jill and Suzanne are both kind of asking, um, what are you working on? Suzanne wants to point out, loves the circus fire. So um, are you working on anything new, anything coming up? Suzanne specifically wants to know about nonfiction. Yeah, no, and I know I'm hoping not to write nonfiction. No, nonfiction is too hard. Um, I like just making stuff up. Um, that's, that's the joy is, you know, in, in fiction, if you need something, you can just make it up. In nonfiction, if you make it up, you're in trouble, or you should be in trouble. Um, so no, no, definitely fiction is next. Um, probably another novel, I imagine. Um, I, I've got a few leads, but I, like, like with this particular book, I mean, this thing took me, you know, 20 plus years just to find my way in. So I've got a lot of things that I'm interested in. The question is, can I find the right narrator can i find the right point of view can i find the right structure that suddenly energizes it and, and makes it really come alive so so that i get that feeling of i'm sort of hot on the trail of these characters living out their lives um yeah that's that's kind of where i am worst places to be um, um, <laughs> starting starting is always the hardest thing um there, there was uh, conrad uh, Joseph Conrad, uh, Ford Maddox Ford lent him the loft in his barn to write in. And Conrad said, I dread climbing those stairs every day. Uh, I, at the beginning, I feel that way. And once I get into it, I'm running up those stairs. Uh, don't, don't let me come down those stairs. Sure. Um, Mike asks, uh, really enjoyed all of your work and you capture the poetry of the everyday so well, which led Mike to wonder if you are re do you read any poetry? And if so, who are your favorites? 
favorite poet? Oh, I, I I try to read a lot of poetry. Um, um, it depends. I mean, I like I like moderns like Mark Strand, um, Dennis Johnson at his very best. Um, uh, I go back to you know Plath and Auden and oh Ginsburg, Whitman, just just almost anybody. Uh, but but mostly for when I was when I was thinking about. Um, the problems that I saw that in, in American fiction back in the, the late 90s, I was reading Liz Holmes, uh, a poet out of uh, Ithaca, New York. And it seemed to me that in her writing, she got closer to the way that we actually feel about the world and about the people closest to us than any of the fiction I was reading. And I just started thinking about, you know, why is that? You know, what do what we overlooked? Why, why are we tarting these things up with, you know, all this, all this frippery, I guess. Um, and I went back to uh, the Sam Hamill translations of the great haiku poets, uh, Busan and Basho and Issa. Um, and that's kind of gave me the, that idea of, of writing a little bit more about the moment and the ephemeral moment and the change of seasons and the changes of life. And that's when I started writing Wish You Were Here and then years later, Emily, and then Henry. And that, that lyric poetry, weirdly enough, sent me off on this epic, you know, thousand page damn, you know, family saga. Um, but, but from those very quiet observations of, you know, just nothing, nothing spectacular, nothing blockbusterish, nothing, no explosions. Um, mm -hmm. you know, in the meantime, I, you know, we did blow up the, the King James Hotel and, in, or the Hotel King David in uh, Jerusalem. So, you know, there will be explosions from time to time. Yeah, every now and then. Um, I, uh, one other person asked this in the questions and I'll ask it too. It's the perfect round out question for a bookstore event. Um, but before I ask it, I'm gonna drop this, the link to your book in the chat there. So everyone can click on that and grab a copy of it from Boswell. Um, but other than, Everyone else is going to be reading Ocean State, but when they're done with that, um, and they're going to tear through it quickly, what are you reading that you're loving now? Uh, well, I just I just finished uh, Brian Evison's uh, story collection. God damn, I can't remember the goddamn title of it. Um, but you would know uh, the new one. No, I think his newest one. Yeah, um, yeah. brown cover. It's from I think it's from uh, is it Gray Wolf or Milkweed? I want to say Gray Wolf. Yeah, really great stories. Reminded me of, of uh, Richard Matheson and uh, Ray Bradbury's fine, fine stuff. Um, just, just really, really loved it. You got it there? No. Damn you. Damn you. Damn totally. me for. Um, yeah, but uh, Brian Evanson, uh, one of the great, great American story writers. Um, and these are. I guess people would call it speculative fiction, but it's just it's just great storytelling, you know, amazing stuff. I'm also reading uh, Garrett Hongo's The Perfect Sound, uh, which is a nonfiction book about his sort of going down the rabbit hole of high end audio, um, and and he, and he works in music and how music ties in with his life. Um, so it's very much like uh, Al Young's Old Body and Soul, where he's seeing his past through all these different songs, um, but with with the extra weirdness of you know, spending thousands of dollars on the equipment yeah, yeah. Um, the obscene amount of money that stuff can cost yeah absolutely cool well this has been great thanks so much for spending the hour with me thank you so much chris i appreciate it uh, please uh, support boswell support your independence out there um, and support your public library don't forget that either